Too much addiction, not enough treatment. That equation is being worked out across rural parts of the United States, and it's especially problematic here in New Mexico. Next week, the PBS series Independent Lens will air a documentary that focuses on the challenge of treating addiction in rural New Mexico. It's called The Providers. And correspondent Megan Kamerick sat down with both the filmmakers and two of the rural healthcare practitioners to talk about the film and the problem at its core. The film The Providers focuses on a team of healthcare workers at El Centro Family Health in northern New Mexico. I'm joined today by the producers and directors of The Providers, Anna Moot Levin, thank you for being here, and Laura Green, thank you so much. Thank you. Also joining us are some of the providers featured in the film. Chris Ruge is a nurse practitioner with El Centro Family Health, and Dr. Leslie Hayes, a family practitioner with El Centro. Thank you all so much. Anna and Laura, what drew you to this topic and why did you choose New Mexico to explore it? Uh, well, Laura and I are both the children of healthcare providers ourselves, but decided medicine, at least in practice, was not for us. Um, but we've also um, been really fascinated by um, healthcare stories um, and um, our previous work in short films has um, focused on healthcare related issues. Um, and back in 2014, um, Laura and I, we went to graduate school and we were discussing um, various topics of, of, of films that we might pursue. And we were really sort of enchanted by this idea of the old country doc. And what does that look like? in today's rural America, which is facing so many challenges, um, economic challenges, substance use challenges. And um, we ended up speaking with people all across the country, about 50 to 60 um, healthcare providers involved in rural medicine and family medicine. Um, and then ultimately we were referred um, to the folks at El Centro Family Health and um, really from when we first started speaking with them we were so moved by their dedication and we felt that setting the film in northern New Mexico would be a really powerful microcosm for the bigger picture and bigger challenges facing rural America at large. Laura, you're present and filming some really difficult conversations in this film, how did you go about gaining the kind of trust mm -hmm. that would allow you to do that? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I really love about documentary is that you sort of, it, they take a long time to make, and that means that you, you spend a long time sort of being with people and finding out what they're comfortable with and building those relationships where they understand you, they understand your intentions, and they sort of, um, join in in the filmmaking process in that way. Um, I think it's also a tremendous testament to the providers that we were working with, that these people, uh, the patients that are in the film, that they said, you know, yes, come in, my relationship with my provider is something that I really value and that I wanna share with the world, that I wanna show the world. Chris, as one of these providers who is shown having a lot of these difficult conversations. Your work takes you directly to people's homes. You talk very frankly about addiction. You even go through one of your patient's refrigerators and talk about healthy eating. How do you establish those kinds of relationships and build that kind of trust? Well, the way I really have looked at uh, working with the, the most complicated patients over the last 20 years is that uh, the core work that needs to be done really is building relationships and establishing trust and uh, being non-judgmental and treating them like you would you would treat someone else who you have a lot of respect for. So uh, I think it takes a while to build that rapport. Uh, they need to know they can trust you and over time uh, that hopefully happens and that makes my work a lot easier and it makes it a lot more likely that they're able to tackle some of the, the more difficult tasks I kind of put in front of them. So, but I, but I think it's, it's a necessary part of the work I do. I look at it as my number one priority, which is establishing a good relationship with my patient. You're very non-judgmental. 
it comes through. You, you, have to, you have to leave your past at the door. Uh, I tell people you have to wipe the slate clean and the visit isn't about me. Um, and if it is about me at the start of the visit, I have to get, get that off the table. Uh, the only way to approach, uh, especially people fighting addictions and, and other issues which, which carry a lot of stigma with them, is to make sure 100% of the time you're not judging them. Uh, you're, you're, your job is to convince them that you're there to be with them, to help them, to help them move forward. Leslie, uh, speaking of judgment, you say many doctors in the film, you make the point, don't view substance abuse treatment as primary care. That is changing. It oh, that's definitely, good. Um, both UNM and the residency where I um, did my training, Duluth uh, Family Practice Center, are doing um, substance use treatment um, in their um, clinics, and residents come out fully trained. And I think more people are starting to view it. I love AA and NA, but I think one of the harmful messages that they got, they got Alcoholics out... Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Narcotics, Narcotics Anonymous. Anonymous. Mm -hmm. One of the harmful messages that they got out was that only an addict or an alcoholic could help another addict or alcoholic. And we don't require that for any other disease state. I mean, you don't have to have diabetes to treat patients with diabetes. You don't have to have um, cancer to treat patients with cancer. It, we'd be in trouble if we expected doctors treating dementia to actually have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, we have this idea that we weren't supposed to treat them if we didn't have substance use disorder, and we're realizing, no, you know, there are definitely things people with substance use disorder bring to the table um, that other um, people who have not been through it don't, but there are still plenty of things that physicians can do. How does putting the primary care focus on it impact success? I think part of it is that I just view it as one of several diseases. I have to take care of it as p opposed to being the defining characteristic of the patient. Um, I, because I take care of patients with many disease states, I view them as a patient who has diabetes and substance use disorder and arthritis rather than being an addict with other things. I mean, that for a long time, patients were sort of defined by that. Um, and I think we're sort of moving to the point of realizing, no, that they're a person first and they have a substance use disorder, same as they may have other conditions and we can treat it and make their life better. It comes through in the film very clearly. Um, you have a very warm demeanor with your patients. <laughs> uh, and Chris, there are some tough moments in the film between you and some of your patients, especially those battling addiction. There's a scene where this woman's begging you for more hydrocodone, who's bedridden. What drew you to this kind of work and what keeps you doing it? I don't know. I think Leslie had something said in the film that uh, you know, the rewards in working with people with excessive needs um, is, for me, you know, just is a lot bigger pat on the back when I, when I help them move forward. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I started out fresh out of nurse practitioner school, taking care of just advanced AIDS patients. So patients who had advanced HIV had already developed one of the AIDS-defining illnesses. And the medicines weren't that good back then. So for half my patients, I helped them die. That was my job. Uh, did my best to, with symptom management and to be with them and to let them die with some dignity. And in a way, it was very tragic and very sad, but I really was able to help a lot of people in ways that I never would have dreamed I was, would be able to help them. And if I was seeing someone once a month for their hypertension, I just don't know if that would give me as much of a, a kick. Uh, um, you know, I, I like being able to work with patients that there's a possibility there of really making a difference. And you have to learn to hang your hat on small successes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they open the door. Uh, they made it to their visit. They took half their meds uh, this month. Uh, they survived. You know, they, they made it through the overdose. And so we have a chance to, to, to start up again, get back on the horse and, and move forward. And, uh, and you bury a lot along the way too. There's, there's a I lot was gonna of say that the converse of that would be when 
people don't make it or things don't work out, you fall hard? When you care for very sick people, uh, a lot of those people, the odds are stacked against them. Um, and uh, you're going you're gonna to bury a lot of people. Uh, people are going to uh, make some decisions that's going to cost them dearly. Uh, yes, that's tragic, but again, uh, you're, you're happy for the work you were able to do with them, the, you know, the time you were able to spend with them. Uh, it doesn't always end, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, with someone riding into the sunset, so. Anna, this, this story will probably be quite an eye-opener for national audiences. There's a lot of compassion fatigue in New Mexico because we hear these stories every day. How do you think this will resonate for New Mexicans? I think for us, really, the heart of the film is about the patient-provider relationship and that that relationship in and of itself has value. And to, to go off what Chris was saying, that you know whether or not patients, quote unquote, get better in all the ways you might hope, that having trusting long-term relationships between underserved communities and healthcare providers really improves quality of life. Um, and so, you know, we've now shown the film multiple times in New Mexico, as well as places all across the country. And I think audiences have really responded in a very positive way that, yes, the film does show a lot of really hard stuff. Um, but we also feel that the film does have a lot of hope in it and that it really does show the beauty in addition to the pain. And really throughout making the film, we were thinking about that duality, that yes, there, there's a lot of suffering, but there's also a lot of really strength, a lot of real strength. Um, and so we hope that that comes through and so far from New Mexico audiences, they, they seem to see that. Laura, where did you find hope in the process amidst all these really hard stories? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I think uh, one of the places that I really found hope um, was um, in the providers and um, they are uh, sort of optimism machines, you know, and um, yeah, yeah, and you know, but I would, you know, we'd spend a day out with Chris and I would be like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so depressed, and Chris would be like, what are you talking about? They opened the door, they're still there, we're still going, you know, we're still fighting the good fight. And um, I, um, <clears throat> I think that um, there are systemic things, you know, poverty, intergenerational trauma, um, you know, education systems, healthcare systems, there's a, a lot of big picture things that need to be addressed, but I do find a lot of hope in individuals making a difference. Um, and I think that's sort of what we saw in this story. And um, yeah, and especially also in the stories of people like Tiffany, mm -hmm. um, who are um, coming to, um, you know, who's right now, she's um, on track to be a PA. That's her, you know, her, her, her this new This is in the young yeah. girl in the Las Vegas high school? Yes, program. yeah, and she was going to be an EMT, right? and then she switched to nursing, and now she's uh, she's going to Highlands. She has her, her eyes set on being a PA. She wants to come back and serve her community, and, you know, we think that's so incredible because that's a job opportunity, that's service for a community, that's somebody that knows the culture, and so um, we find those passionate young people incredibly hopeful as well. Chris, uh, your position in the film that we learned about it was funded by this pilot program from Project Echo called Echo Care. It, during the film, you get notice that this was ending. What's the status now? Well, we were, um, a couple things changed. One is we were, the, the entire three years, we were closely tied in with Project Echo. So we had a dedicated two-hour uh, specialty clinic called Complex Care Clinic where I was able to, every week, uh, t talk with a panel including cardiology, renal, uh, pulmonology, psychiatry, a number of specialists. Uh, it's a one-of-a-kind clinic that Project Echo just created for this, for this purpose. Mm. And it was, gave me an amazing amount of support caring for very sick people. 
that ended at the end of the pilot. So uh, that resource disappeared. Um, at the same time, the insurance companies totally funded, the four Medicaid uh, MCOs totally funded the, the pilot, all of our salaries uh, and other office expenses. And that ended. Uh, two of the insurance companies came back after uh, the end of the pilot and offered us um, uh, in a, uh, an amount of money that would help support us moving forward, uh, but it was probably less than a fourth of mm. what our operating expenses actually were at, when we totaled that up. So it's just meant that I've uh, had to ramp up uh, the number of visits. I've mm. had to cut back on uh, home visits, except for uh, cases when it was absolutely necessary. I, many aspects of the program remain the same. My staff remained intact. The clinic, uh, uh, bless them, is the only clinic among six in the state that opted to continue supporting this team. And I think mainly because El Centro has a real strong commitment to the communities they serve. And they're going in the red uh, with my program. Um, and hopefully uh, what the future will bring uh, is some other added commitments by the, the new uh, M MCO structure we have in the state so that it's the managed care organization can continue mm -hmm. to do it, yes. Well, I wanted to ask you and Leslie, what are important elements of what you think sustainable, a sustainable substance abuse treatment model would look like? Um, so I think for opioids, there's no doubt that medication is the basis. I mean, for the vast majority of patients, the studies have shown mm. that patients just do much better on medications. And there's a like lot of buprenorphine, buprenorphine and methadone. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stigma around the medications, and a lot of people think it isn't real recovery. Mm. But to my mind, these people are more likely to have jobs. They're more likely to be not getting HIV and hepatitis C. They're more likely to be able to keep their kids. They're far less likely to be using substances and they're far less likely to die of overdoses. To me, that is really very much a success story. And um, so I think in addition, um, getting support, um, people with uh, substance use disorder often have very poor what we call executive skills and that's sort of the ability to organize your life, the ability to make and keep medical appointments, for instance. Um, <laughs> Uh, the ability to show up every day for a job, to be on time, to um, get your kids to school, to make sure there's food in the house, to make sure you've paid all your bills. These are people who often were raised in very chaotic environments and may not have the skills to do this. So um, for many people need those kind of skills. Other people have those skills but you know may have suffered um, problems in relationships or significant loss. So dealing with um, any other um, trauma that they have, I think, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of system-wide things I think we need to do. Um, one is just improving the economy, because I'll tell you, when patients get jobs, it makes a huge difference for the vast majority of them. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, I think at some point we need to deal, and this is a this will improve things 20 down, years down the road. But um, children of people who are incarcerated, I think is a big deal um, because so many of, um, of my patients, I've been surprised to learn, had parents who were in jail for significant portions of their childhood. And then making sure we're taking care of uh, the kids and making sure the education system is good. What can we learn from our healthcare system and our public health system in America in general from this microcosm? in northern New Mexico. So one point I do want to make, because everybody has come up to me after this film and said, oh, you did such an amazing job, is that almost all of the physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs I know are doing that with their patients. You know, I happen to get caught on film and I do a few things that other people don't <laughs> um, as far as uh, treating substance use disorder. But most of the physicians and other healthcare practitioners I know are working really, really hard to establish that relationship with patients and really care very much about what happens to their patients. So I would like people to come away with that knowledge that really 
we do care about their health and we really do want what's best for them. And it can occasionally be hard to make that connection. Um, but I think for most of us, we really do try. Are you finding, Anna, as you go around the country, this is a small northern New Mexico, this little microcosm. Um, are people watching Anna and Chris and the people in this film and saying, these are things that relate to what's wrong and what we could do better in the rest of the country? Yeah, well, I think that um, a lot of healthcare practitioners really identify with um, what the healthcare providers are going through in the film um, and, you know, how hard the work is, but I think it also reinvigorates um, current healthcare practitioners. Um, and that's something that we're working to do is to really bring the film to students going into the medical fields, as well as um, current practitioners across the country. Um, so I think that the medical community has really um, identified um, with um, Matt and Chris and Leslie, who we show in the film. And yes, I mean, substance use disorder is such a major issue. Um, across the country and is touching the lives of so many people um, and is really intertwined. I think w what we've worked to do um, in our film is to really give that some context, that it's not um, about you know someone's individual personal failing, but that um, there's a context of rural communities that are struggling um, economically and all of these systemic challenges and um, that the, the trauma and the addiction gets passed down over generations. Um, and so I think that people um, can really connect um, with that idea. Well, thank you all for being here. It's a really inspiring film and thank you for making it. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you so much. We're going to keep at this issue here with the line, but before we do, I want to remind you that The Providers airs Monday, April 8th at 9 p.m. on New Mexico PBS, and again on Saturday, April 13th at 10 p.m. It's well worth watching.